Hi, welcome to the AFC Clubhouse Conversation online series. My name is Jim Hemphill. I'm a filmmaker and frequent contributor to American Cinematographer Magazine. Today's guest is Gonzalo Amat, cinematographer for The Man in the High Castle. Uh, let's take a look at the trailer. If the Nazis can be beaten in that world, they can be beaten in this one. that we have been a part of, it has to stop. I don't know how. Why did you come back? To kill John Smith. It ended when you said goodbye. Gonzalo, welcome. Welcome, thank you. Pleasure being with you. Yeah, great to see you. Uh, before we jump into the specifics of different Man in the High Castle clips and scenes and things like that, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your initial involvement with the series, because you've been on it, as far as I remember, since season one, right, right from, I think, the second episode. So tell me a little bit about how you first, how the show first came to you, and what it was about it that you responded to. So originally, I, I was, uh, my agent told me about this project, but uh, they reached out because they had seen a project that I had done in Mexico, my first uh, TV project that I've done. I always wanted to get into TV, so I um, asked a friend, and, and then some friends were producing a, a project in Mexico. I was already living in Los Angeles, and they say, hey, come over and do this with us. It's a great series. So I went with them, did that project called Nino Santo, and then that project ended up in the hands of um, David Soccer and Ridley Scott and all those guys at uh, Scott Free. Uh, so they saw it and they were familiar with it. So at some point, I think when my agents mentioned my name to them as a possible uh, candidate, they responded to that because they had seen that project and they really liked it. So, and you know, then I interviewed and, and, all, and all of that. And um, that, that's how I got into it. But. Um, what uh, caught my attention from it was the fact that it was just like nothing I've ever seen. Like the pilot was just incredible. And then I was, of course, very familiar with um, Philip K. Dick from Blade Runner, which is probably the movie that got me into cinematography. So for me, it was like, wow. And even though I didn't have anything like that on my reel, like stylized and noir, everything on my reel was a little more like, uh, you know, more handheld, more um, freestyle and all of that. Um, I think uh, that's what we're, they were looking for, kind of a, a little bit of that also in the, within the style. So, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. Well, now, you, so you mentioned going in and interviewing. On a show like this, I'm curious, because on a, on a feature film, you probably meet with the director, maybe some producers, whatever. Uh, on a show like this, who are the people you're meeting with initially? Is it showrunners? Is there a producing director? Is it... Ridley, who, who, who's, the, who's the group that you have to meet with and what are your initial conversations with them like? Yeah, my first interview was with a producer, with Richard Hughes. Um, but in the room, I was like, you know, video conference because I was in New York, they were in LA. There were like 10 people in the room. There was a lot of people from, um, from uh, Ridley Scott's company. So it was David Zucker and a few other uh, members there, staff members from, from the uh, TV department. Um, and then I had a second interview with the uh, supervising director, Dan Percival. I didn't really talk to the showrunner um, before. I met him when, once we were on the set. But of course, he was involved in all the conversations, uh, looking at reels and stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it was two, two interviews. The first one, the producer, just kind of to know how I worked and the timing. And, uh, you know, he was like, what do you think of 10 day episodes? What do you think of this? And so kind of... Um, an idea like that and then just to kind of testing what uh, i was thinking of them um, because the project project was very very ambitious as you can see uh and with not unlimited time for sure um and then the second interview i had with dan percival was more like a creative interview about you know style and and content not so much about production or anything like that and then a little bit of what he was he responded to in my reel and what he thought i could bring to the table so that was th those were the two kind of steps I had, and then from then on, I was uh, they offered to me pretty quickly, and then you know I was on the plane next week. And so when you had that meeting with the supervising director, what kinds of uh, things did you guys talk about in terms of 
what the sort of visual principles for the show were going to be. Yeah. So uh, when he talked to me about it, he he wanted to um, sort of convey what he wasn't um, responding to from the pilot that he wanted to uh, evolve visually. Like he he wanted to make it a little more personable, a little more um, character based and not so much about the world in which these characters lived. Because, um, I mean, if you look at the pilot, which is beautiful, you can see it's it's a lot about the world, but the the connection, not, not so much the connection with the characters. So he wanted to make sure that we got into it. And then, uh, so there was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, references. We talk about the visual references for the style in terms of like, you know, the conformist Blade Runner and stuff like that, but also references about um, this more personable style, like, you know, In the Mood for Love and um, The Insider, just being inside with the characters, just being really close. Um, so, you know, just bouncing ideas back and forth with that, and it just kind of tried to discover what the style would be, the transitional style from the pilot to the, um, to the series, you know, and also in terms of, you know, color palette and lighting and, this, and stuff like that. We just had a conversation about all of those things, and then it ended up kind of showing in them. Um, evolving in um in the second episode that you saw and then from then on with uh with jim hawkinson and the other dp and then we just kind of ended up finding the style for the show uh so you mentioned the other dp so you're alternating dps on this show mm -hmm. what kind of collaboration do you have with the other dp how many conversations do the two of you have i mean a lot like since the beginning you know he did the pilot so we had a he had a very um, good idea what he used for, for the equipment wise. So we kind of got that and adapted a little bit for the new um, ideas that Dan Percival was bringing to the table and I was bringing to the table. And then we both, you know, talk about crew, like what are we looking for crew? So we went to Vancouver. I was there first. So I was, uh, I had a chance to interview the people in person and then he would uh, sort of interview them via Skype or whatever. So between both of us, we would say, okay, what do you think of this guy? Okay, we like the, this, uh, this guy or this guy's resume is better. So we, we both have a lot of conversations and same thing with, st with sets, you know. There's a new set here. So um, I would walk the set, I would send them pictures, talk to the gaffer, we all get on the phone call, you know. So it was just a lot of, of talk. And then when we started shooting, it was mostly just like, you know, you shoot and then he shoots and then we ended up just having a very... Uh, a show that's very unified, but at the same time has kind of nice salties to his uh, work and to my work that uh, probably just someone who's very good, um, has a very good eye can see. Like difference in diffusion, for example, the differences in a little bit of fill light or, or stuff like that. Um, so the conversation is constant. And then it's funny because by the end of the series, we had to do a lot of work for each other. Like, hey, you know, I have to shoot this scene from your episode. So... Um, we would talk and I would like, you're going to like it. I'm going to do this for you. So it was funny because I was sort of copying his style and he was trying to kind of give me what I like. So it was really, and James is amazing. He's an artist and um, he's, uh, he has a great sense of the integrity when it comes to the style. So I really learned a lot from that. And uh, I think it was, we were able to combine both styles and bring this to the show together, you know. Um, well, before we get into some uh, clips from season four, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the show's style as having evolved over the course of several seasons and how you sort of define uh, what your approach was here to this most recent and final season. Yeah, I think um, probably the first season, I would say we tried to discover the, a little bit of the style of the show and the language and how we work together as a crew um, and then how do we, you know, illustrate the scripts and how, how to, you know, just kind of discover it. And I, I think pretty quickly we kind of got a vibe of it. I think probably a couple of episodes in, we were already, the crew was already kind of really working uh, very well together. Um, and then I think the first season was very sort of solid when it comes to that. And then second, second season, there were some changes with the writers and showrunners and stuff like that. So... That was a little bit of um, complicated because then we got some new scripts that were shorter uh, turnarounds, so we had less time to prepare. So I felt like, I mean, visually we're doing the same, but I don't think we had enough time to kind of reinvent and try to re to, to polish what we had achieved on the first one. 
Um, and then um, we also, you know, adapting to the feedback that we got from Ridley Scott and uh, that we got from everyone, you know, like, okay, what can we do better? And we always talk together as a crew, like, you know, with the operators and, and with the gaffer and the key grip. What can we do better? What can we be more efficient at with production? So that was constant. And then I would say season three and four were probably visually for me the most, uh, the ones I liked the most visually, because I think we really went bold. For me, it was more like, you know, this project, people respond to the way it looks. So I'm just, we're just going to go for it, you know, like. So really trying to make it bold when it comes to decisions, coverage of scene, lighting, you know, a lot of silhouettes sometimes. And sometimes we would get calls from the studio saying, hey, um, is this how you guys are going to shoot it? Or is this? And we're like, yeah, this is it. Oh, OK, good. Good to know, because we were wondering. It's a little, you know, dark, but uh, we were wondering. And they were really supportive, too. And then by season four, I think it was um, we didn't really know it was going to be the last season, but we had a sense it might be. So it was more like, uh, for me, it was just, I really want to enjoy it. For me, it was like, I want to enjoy the people that I've worked with. And I really want to enjoy the moment and really savor those moments because I think it's a unique project. Unique for me, for my career, what it's done to my career. Um, so for me, it was really try to uh, get into the story, get into the characters um, and, and try to make it the most of it, you know, and try to be also again, super bold and, uh, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, every season we also had a lot of talking during the season with uh, Dan Percival and, and the showrunner um, who, who um, on this fourth season was a different one. Um, so we were always constantly talking about how can we make this episode, you know, episode two, that was a little, you know, can we make this better or can we make a little less of this? So we were always kind of tweaking from episode to episode. Because, of course, when you get, have guest directors, they have their own vision and you have to try to keep it, a unity to it, you know. So it was a constant reinvention. And um, I would say uh, this last one's probably the boldest. And it's, for me, uh, the, the, my best work, I would say, like three and four, my best work and uh, probably four even more. Um, and I would say I also did differently, just empowering people a little more, you know, because, you know, you work with this people who are so talented, like Gaffer, Key Grip, all the crew, um, all, all my camera crew. So when you listen to one idea, they, and you put that idea up, they will give you another, another one and another one. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in teamwork. So I really try to push that to the limit, you know, like, okay, let's try your idea. Let's see what happens, you know? So I was really curating ideas by this last season. It was awesome. This is a really amazing experience. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the guest directors. I'm curious, what were what the challenges in maintaining the visual consistency for the series when you are working with so many different directors who are coming in? And where's that line in terms of kind of trying to keep the consistency, but also letting them bring what they can bring to it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of conversation. The toughest, I think, was the first season because people didn't really know what we were going for. And then sometimes directors would come in with their uh, background and say, you know, I really want to get make sure we get all the pieces that we need and all of that. And, and it was kind of hard to communicate that that was not the style of the show, that we would, it was more like we're doing like a little movie and we're committing to the ideas that, because sometimes the time that it takes to execute those ideas doesn't leave you the time to do. Let's do coverage of everyone. Let's do a few sizes for each actor. So the message for me to the direct, guest director was always like, just, you know, let's commit to ideas and don't worry about giving too many options to the editors um, in terms of we, um, they, they're not going to ask you for close-ups from everyone, stuff like that, you know? So navigating that, um, uh, that line is always tricky. And then by season two, people knew what the show was. So they came a little more asking, hey, so what do you guys normally do for this? What do you do for this? And they were more relaxed, kind of giving it in our hands as, uh, as DPs, always asking, you know, do, do I need a close-up of this or should we move on? And so that was great uh, confidence from us, you know, to really have that confidence from the directors. Um, and then, but also because it depends a lot on the style of the director. Some, some directors will be very hands-off when it comes to the visuals. Uh, and they would say, okay, what do you guys would do for this scene? And we would kind of come up with a 
coverage plan or how to shoot the scene, we would pitch it to the director and he would say, that's great, but I want to make sure we get this beat, blah, blah, blah. Or some directors were like, I want a camera here with this lens and I want to get this shot. So as a DP, you have to know how to learn to work with both and, um, and get also what you want as a DP for your responsibility as a, as a keeping the unity of the show. Uh, so it's a, it's very tough balance also because uh, you can't, you have to be political. You can say, you can't just say, no, we don't do that. I mean, sometimes you say, okay, we don't do Dutch angles on the show, but I mean, if you like it, let's do it. But why don't we do a safe version so we don't get, um, you know, comments from editorial saying, what is this, you know? So we're always trying to be political about it too, because, you know, you don't want to shut down a director and, and, and you want to keep the relationship. You want to keep the creativity going. And, uh, I think once you do that, people will have confidence and they relax and, um, and it's a really good uh, collaboration. It's all about collaboration, you know? Uh, let's take a look at some clips from the show. Um, first one is, uh, this is the, the interior train conversation. Uh, do you want to say anything about it before we look at it or? Yeah. I mean, just, um, our whole thing was just so many, we had a lot of meetings about this train, um, scenes, stunt, everything. Um, and then for me, this is sort of the culmination of, of teamwork because it, it's so many people involved in this and the design of the set and it's a, it's a modular set and it separated in two and it rotated and have like screens, projections. It's just really technically very advanced. But at the same time, the way we shot the dialogue scenes, it's the way we used to do them, you know, very intimate. And it's all about the performance and it's all about the actor. So I think it's a nice combination of how to try to make the technique invisible to the viewer and not call attention to, okay, we are flashy, you know, so just let this, let the story play, you know, because the more they get into the story, the more effective it will be what happens at the end of, of the scene, you know, and that's probably all I want to say. Well, let's take a look at it. So you mentioned that there are a lot of different components that are going into this. What are, what are some of the various pieces and collaborators that you're working with to make something like this happen? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, since it's sort of kind of a heavy visual effect sequence, everything, you know, from the interior to the exterior to the, um, you know, the bridge and the train all being 100% uh, built, v v VFX. It, um, you know, you have to be involved from the beginning. Like this scene was super storyboarded. Every angle is uh, in the storyboard because we really wanted to know exactly what was going to happen, you know? Um, and then of course, divide the scene between like four parts, you know, like the dialogue, first dialogue part, the second dialogue part, the, previ the previous to the, to the crash of the train, the actual stunt of the train, and then the, the, um, the crash in locate in stage inside the train and the crash outside the train that was more than four but you <laughs> you know what i mean it's just a lot of pieces and then those pieces um have to be consistent you have to be consistent in everything you do from the eye lines to the rhythm to everything so it's just so many people involved and so many people have to be part of this conversation um yeah and then just finding a location that worked for that too which is great i mean that location just was perfect you know and um it was really tricky logistically because it was, uh, you know, as you saw, there's a lot of snow on the ground still, but it melted. So how to keep continuity of the snow it was super muddy. So anything we had to do, we ended up having to have a crane with some like special tires made. So we're able to go on the, on the mud. And then, you know, every time you walk, the crew walks through the mud, you have to make sure you, the footsteps are not in, all those things, you know, and, make, and we had to make sure that that was in the right orientation for, the sunlights, because we were shooting there for like two days. And that, this, that would match the sun, what we did on the stage, where the sun was at some point and where the sun moves and the fact that they're going south. So it's just a lot of layers that probably, I don't know that the viewer will be able to say, but I think it does give it a sense of realism that, uh, that works nicely, you know? And um, what kind of camera do you shoot the show with? Uh, we shot uh, with this season four on the Alexa Mini, so we had two Alexa Minis, um, and then we will have one more, one for the Steadicam AB, and then we had a uh, Alexa SXT, which is this slightly older one, but it, it does some uh, more high speed. So we 
for the, some of the stunt uh, stuff on the train tips inside, we shot that with a, with an Alexa SXT because we, we could do high speed and all of that. Uh, and then just because the camera's smaller and it has uh, internal filters and stuff, that's why we chose that camera. Mm -hmm. um, and what? You, that, but that you sh you began the series with a different camera, right? When did you? What did you start yeah. with? And and when did and when and why did you switch over to the Alexa? So the first season, the pilot was shot on the, on the red, and then because Amazon had a 4K uh, mandate, they wanted to keep it on 4K, and there was no option to do Alexa on 4K in that moment. So we we just continue with the red. And then by the end of the season, we sort of got together, Jim and I, and then, and then some people from the uh, visual effects um, post who were saying, you know, guys, uh, is there a possibility we can probably go transition to an Alexa just because the workflow will be easier for us. And then in terms of uh, what the red cameras uh, were in that moment compared to the Alexa, I think they were a little slower. Uh, less sensitive to light, so it, it did require more lighting and then more fill light inside the studios. When you wanted to see a wall, you had to put more fill light. So it was kind of against. We were a little bit struggling with the sense that you had to make this look. You had to light more than we wanted. So when we then we pitched uh, going to the with the Alexa and then uprising to 4K, and the studio said yes, which was awesome. So then we did some tests on the beginning of season two, and then we loved it because it was just a lot of less light. We, we could literally just put the lens wide open, put one single source, and that was it. And you could see the um, you could see the wallpaper inside. You could at night you could see the depth because uh, uh, um, we struggled with that the first season a little bit because the red camera wasn't uh, at that point it wasn't um, as fast as the Alexa. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, let's take a look at another uh, clip. This one. Um, is, uh, I believe, the ending scene in the tunnel from episode 410. Do you want to say anything to set that up before we look at it? Sure. I mean, this uh, this set was uh, set from season three, from the uh, ending of season three. I think it was kind of a, the same thing, or like our big set piece for the season in um, in the same way that the, that the train was for this. Um, but the tunnel also played on as a big uh, part of, uh, of season four. So on the beginning, at the ending of season three, we also got together. What does this tunnel look like? What is it? You know, so we had a lot of philosophical conversations about it. And then from there, we kind of developed the look, you know, is this, is this a time portal? Is this a, a parallel world portal? What does that look like? What would that look like physically? So Dan Percival, he was, you know, expressing um, his ideas, you know, with just like a words like, I want it to be like liquid. I want the light to be liquid. I want it to feel like you're, um, but at the same time, the mechanic, because this machine is created by humans. Now they're using a natural um, magnetic area, but they're kind of enhancing it. So how do you make that visually? So we just try things, you know, and then just bouncing ideas. And how do you photograph this tunnel, which is a practical set, but of course it's not as long. So how do you make 65 foot uh, long tunnel feel like it's a thousand, you know, practically without having to do every visual effect shot. So um, and again, a lot of conversations about how to make this, a lot of really great ideas from every department. Um, and there are gaffer, a gaffer pitch, you know, an idea of putting a mirror like a convex mirror behind, um, like a black net, and then putting some literally concert lights on the truss, uh, just really complex lighting scheme. So when it was off, you could not you could not see anything, which is black. When it was on, you can see anything because it was just white to wash with light. You know? So how do you execute those ideas and make them practical? You know, So it was just a lot of really good teamwork. And then for me, just kind of trying to make those ideas land with the story. So how do you make this feel like um, realistic? And, and on this scene that you guys will see, we changed the color. The tunnel was normally cooler because we wanted to give that sense of machine. Um, on this final sequence, we changed it to a warm color because uh, we wanted to make the audience understand that this is kind of a, like an event, uh, like a natural event uh, in which um, there's no mechanics anymore, the machine's broken, but it just happens, you know? So, I don't know. Those are just <laughs> rough ideas. Okay, let's take a look at the clip. So I think when the sound stops, that's when 
you know, it changes. So it changes to that cool color to this warm color. That white shot was shot with an eight millimeter lens, which is very rare and we yeah. used a lot for this tunnel, just to really make it feel like it's far, you know? And then just a lot of, I mean, according to a gaffer, we're, a gaffer, we had like a million watts of light behind that, just to give that, uh, it was a lot of lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this scene, you know, a lot of the scenes on this show, I watch them and I think your collaboration with the production designer must be just so vital uh, planning this kind of stuff. I mean, how, how closely do you work with the production designer on this show? Oh, I mean, it was true about the, um, the production design. It was amazing because he really understood, he really understands what the camera sees. There was sometimes, um, you know, production designers tend to build sets and they don't really necessarily understand that you have to photograph this a certain way or just a small detail like, you know, putting texture on the walls of the set, like, you know, like it's wet and there's some, some patches of water coming down the tunnel, really makes him on, on the, understand that the, the light will bounce in a different way, so it will make it feel like a real tunnel, you know, just stuff like that. So collaboration with him was just huge, like in, 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 even in just a normal location, like location or a set that he built, we would talk constantly, just constantly. And he has a great way of working in which he draws concepts and, and then you can bounce ideas off the concepts. Instead of just saying, uh, you know, I'm going to do a tunnel and it's going to be like this. He draw, he will do a drawing and he will draw like what he thinks this should look like. And then we'll go back and forth and say, you know, I might want to shoot this with a wider lens. So we go back and forth uh, and then just on regular sets, like, uh, you know, he will pitch ideas for, you know, which uh, walls would move or this or that. And we would say, okay, um, why don't we put a window here? Why don't we do this? So it was just a constant conversation, but uh, he had just a really good idea of what, um, what the camera sees and how we tell the story on the, on the, on the show too. Cause you can build a set and then if you always shoot a certain way, you know, you're not going to see this. So how do you maximize your resources for what the camera sees, you know? So which is really smart. That, and I think that's why the show looks more expensive than it is in a way, because just because he was really smart and putting the money art wise in front of the camera. And I think we tried with do the same with our uh, with camera, the way we shot the sets, you know. Really be smart about making it feel bigger than it is and just more real than it is, you know. I want to look at another clip. This one is a flashback scene from episode 402 and i think this is sort of a good example of a purely uh character driven scene i believe with no visual effects or anything like that uh do you want to say anything about that scene before we look at it uh no no just i mean let's have a look yeah um this this is um a really great example of discovering a scene in, in when you're shooting, different to what the concept that you have in your mind, like the director of this, uh, Nelson McCormick. He's, he's a, a very prepared director. He always has like shots and he's one of the ones that he will tell you, I wanted this shot specifically here. I wanted a close up of this actor. And then when we rehearse the scene, he really said, you know what, I'm gonna, let's just rehearse it. So we rehearsed for a, a long time, maybe a couple of hours. And then he really wanted to say, okay, I really want to be with her, with Belle. I want to see this through her eyes. So we're discovering this room through her eyes. You know, this is uh, the moment that she discovers that uh, African-Americans can have freedom in this oppressed world, being part of this group, you know? So she, it's all about what she's seeing and her reaction, what she sees and her reaction, and just being flo floating with her. So this is all Steadicam. Um, and you, you know, you start wide and then you close, you could close with her, then you see what she's seeing. So it's just, it's just kind of a flow of the way that she was um, seeing this moment, you know, like really discovering with a lot of, uh, of illusion um, that uh, there's a possibility of freedom and hope in, for, for, for African Americans in this world, you know. Um, and then the way that we shot the scene as compared to what uh, Nestle originally um, wanted was to really just be with her and then it's all about her and then when the guy when Hampton starts talking it's all about her you know so 
we didn't really get a lot of we were going to move the cameras and get a lot of angles of different people we just ended up being all about her and what she saw um so you know i, I think it ended up being a great scene about point of view which was, was what we really always wanted on this show how to tell a story through someone's eyes you know and in this case i think it's kind of a perfect example of, of that and it's one of my favorite scenes uh, of the of the show and of the season just because it's so moving what's going on and i think it's uh the way we shot it kind of helps uh the audience get into that sense of first person you know yeah well the show in general i find that the performances on the show are really pretty consistently excellent and i'm curious as a cinematographer how you see your role in terms of sort of creating an environment that's going to facilitate the best work from the actors yeah so well i i have a lot of respect for for actors and how actors uh tell the story because they have their i mean they they're the face of what you're do everyone's doing and they, they have to you know expose themselves in front of the camera so for me sometimes i try to you know if i have a good relationship with an actor in this uh, project i have a great relationship with all the actors sometimes i would ask them you know how would how do you see the scene you know how do you visualize your arc as an actor uh through through this um and they they would say well i'm i'm thinking maybe i'll do this or maybe i'll do that or i'll move or i want one more so that gives me an idea of of um how they're gonna play it so that gives me an idea how to approach a scene or, or for example i know certain uh, actors like to have more space so that you don't, you don't know what they're gonna end up. Um, you, so I, you know you have to give them freedom. You can't be lighting for marks and stuff. If you're here, you hit your mark. You can't do that to an actor um, who work, doesn't work like that. So for me, it was trying to work with each actor differently, you know, and then try to get the best of my work and their work um, and try to give them the space to, um, to work properly, you know, and then, the way I work on set also, it's very catered also to respecting the way the actors work. You know, I try to be sort of minimum impact on what they do and uh, give them space when they're blocking, with, you know, and then suggest ideas and, and all of that. But uh, at the same time, make it about, um, you know, what the camera will see that they're doing, you know. And then sometimes suggestions come up and they'll ask, you know, uh, and then you try to collaborate when it comes to that. Um, but um. For me, it's uh, it's it's really important because it ends up play it being if you have, if an actor is stressed because you don't have time to do a scene, you will see that, you know. Or if you have a if an actor is stressed because you messed up, um, you know, the camera didn't hit the mark or something. Then again, it's gonna affect the performance. So you try to be as best as, as you can to with all your elements to give them this and then once it's theirs, the set's theirs, you know? So I don't know, that's that's the way I, I work on this. This show was uh, specifically very uh, catered to that, in my opinion. Uh, well, now we're up to a scene that uh, I have no idea how you did it. This is the, the multiverse room, the mirrors oh, yeah. and all this stuff. So uh, uh, do you want to say anything about it before we look at it? Yeah, I mean, again, this is like uh, someone wrote, you know, this is a, a room with no, I mean, the, the words on the on the page were really something, and they were like, "How are we gonna do this?" You know. So of course, Drew came and came up with an idea. Let's do a mirror room. But how do how are we gonna shoot it? So well, once you put a camera, once you have one not one reflection, but like a thousand reflections, well, you're gonna have to erase every every shot's gonna have to be a visual effect shot. So then someone thought, well, what if we do a room that has one of the mirror walls? It's just a, a one of those. Um, Hessel mirrors, the ones that you can see through, but you can't, um, it's still a mirror, like a 50% mirror. I don't know what the name, technical name of it is. So one of the four walls of the set is, a whole, it's all of it, it's a mirror um, that you can see through. So that's where we shot the, most of the scenes from. So there's no erasing uh, cameras, there's no nothing. I mean, of course, sound, so lavaliers, there's no boom in there. Um, so when we had to move the camera, we just moved, put track outside of this little box. Um, we want to shoot the reverse, we just move the actors. So, and then of course lighting, how do you light a scene like that? How do you light a set like that? Well, you can't have any movie lights, of course, because you'll see them. So we just ended up also another idea from, uh, from um, 
from the crew, from the gaffer was like, why don't we just put a light in the center, you know, uh, which also is, as a prop, you know, that light will uh, generate um, the light that we need. The actors will always be moving around there. So we always have nice lighting on them, you know. Um, the difficult part is getting the balance to light the actors in the room and not being blown up completely. So, you know, it has challenges. Um, but yeah, so there's, as you see, like that scene that you'll see probably has, I, I don't know if uh, I might be wrong, but I, I think it's 100% practical. There's no visual effects anywhere. So that's, I mean, the actors right there through that. Uh, so we're shooting through this through glass, basically. This is on a wide lens all the way back. So there's no visual effects there. It has a door with no handle. So actually that door without the handle would make you not be able to see when we rotate the actors, you know? So this is all shot through glass, you know? a theory. The presence of an observer in an experiment pretty i mean the, the thing that you can tell that we had to be a little longer than we normally used on this show because on the on this show we normally did like 40 and 65 were sort of our yeah. lens for this type of situation here you can tell it's like it's more like 65 to 100 and then we did sometimes get in into into the room um and then we just made sure with there's of course, you can erase the reflections, but why do it if you can do it in camera? So we would just black the camera and do it, or just put the actor really close to the to the glass and shoot him through the glass, like on this instance here. You know, but that's probably that's probably sixty five that lens. Yeah. So that blocking was really important here too because you have to explain to the actors, okay, this is what we're doing. You guys are only shooting from one side, so. Every time you rotate, you're gonna have to pretend the door is somewhere else. It was a little confusing for some of the actors, um, but it ended up working nicely. And then, of course, eye lines all get messed up. Careful out there, John. You know. Do you, do you cover yourself at all for things like like with the eye lines? Do you do anything like shooting? Do you shoot them looking two different ways just to be safe or anything like that, or do you just no, figure it all out there? Yeah, yeah, we would, we would just commit, you know, that's, I mean, you could tell that's, a, you know, reflection of reflection. And then another thing uh, I forgot to mention is just not the walls or the ceiling and the ground are also a mirror. So you would stand and look down and you would see like literally infinity of mirrors going down um, and then same thing up. So it was kind of mind bending. You go in there, you, would, you get dizzy after a while because you, there's, your brain didn't really understand that there's no... Uh, no, nothing to hang on to. Uh, the challenge was also to keep it super clean, so have no with no fingerprints, no nothing. No one's allowed in there. Of course, everyone was tempted to go in there and take pictures. You know, with uh, it, you had to be careful about it. The scratches, um, and then same thing. Another issue we had was just the fall off. You know, when you have a um, a mirror, and every time you do a reflection, you lose like a you lose some light. So. Same thing, you know, if, you, if we knew that we were going to shoot into a reflection only, we have to bring the level up so you get more reflections, you know. And same thing, you know, the, the just the parallax of the mirrors to be perfect so you have a sense of infinity instead of just going to one side, you know. And th this idea was uh, uh, art director uh, uh, Dean, uh, Dean's idea to put a mirror on one side and just really black it out behind and and um it, i think it worked out really well yeah no it's fantastic it's one of my favorite uh scenes in the series um well, let's go to the last clip this one is uh juliana going to the lincoln memorial do you want to say anything oh, yeah. about this before we look at it yeah i mean same thing you know very challenging when we read it you read the scene and yeah juliana you know she walks through she sits to meditate at the lincoln memorial and then, you know, she wakes up and it's destroyed. And it's like, okay, how do we make this? So uh, same thing, uh, storyboard. We started the, even before the director was on on this episode. We like we already had a, an idea of how we were going to execute it. So when the director came, it's like, this is what we were kind of pitching. Um, and then, so, and it was very complicated too, because it had a few pieces too. You know, you have the, um, the sitting down, in Washington DC, seeing the actual thing. And then she sits down at the transition into the destroyed memorial, which was another um, visual effects that's on the stage. And then she walks down the stairs into um, open into the mall, which is another location 
which is a practical location with rubble and stuff. So how do you blend those three pieces together, you know? And then what does that transition look like in terms of lighting, you know? Like what does the light inside the Lincoln Memorial look like? So, because we didn't practically, like the main unit didn't go, we sent a second unit with a, a, a body double, um, which actually got to talk to the actress about the language. It's, um, she was, um, she's an actress, so it's, uh, it was easier, but then, matching the hair and then just getting a small uh, camera unit to go there. And of course you can't put a tripod there. So we have to shoot, in, they have to shoot on Steadicam. We have to tell them the shots exactly that we wanted, which lens goes on each, uh, on each shot. And then when we got that material, we blended it with, uh, with the plates of, uh, of the memorial. I was there recently before we shot this. So I had a really good idea of what the lighting looked like before. So uh, we kind of recreated that sort of uh, alabaster lighting look. Uh, before she when she sits down, and then when after we wanted to create this kind of a nuclear uh, post nuclear uh, radiation dirty moonlight look, you know. So transition from one to the other, all programmed together with a camera move. I mean, it's just really complicated. And then we got uh, uh, an equipment that we use for visual effects, which is called the end cam, which uh, which allows you to see like a wireframe model of what you're photographing. On the green screen, you put the green screen, you put the actor in front, and then you, the um, software will recognize which lens you're using, and then it will tell you this is what you would see of the memorial behind her. So we use that also to design the shots and all that. Um, you know, it's a great system. Sure. Okay, let's take a look at the clip. So everything before this is the um, mixture of her practically, and this is at the aftermath, which is, this is all on the stage, but we wanted to make it real. So all these big pieces of rubble, they're real. They're like styrofoam and, you know, aged and all those. Um, I created the stairs. That's all green behind her. Um, but all the foreground pieces are real. And then this is all back in the stage. This is a hundred percent like that, this shots, you know, there's no visual effects on this specific shot. And then this, you know, same thing, we went really far and just got that piece of her and put it into this bigger CGI created landscape. And this is the third location, which is this is exterior night in a concrete plant. I don't even know what it was. So they built that wall. We put all this rubble around. And and then we had to light it with the same, exactly the same color as we did on the stage. Um, we use the same sources with sky panels. On um, in this case, they were on a um, crane. Hold on right there, you two. On the in the stage, they were uh, through some diffusion. Show me your hands. Arms up. How much when you you know given you know some of these pieces are so these uh, scenes are so complicated and there's so many different pieces that have to come together and you have to maintain consistency. Do you, uh, do you do a lot of work on this show in post in the grade or do you try to get it, most of it in camera on set? Most of it we, we try on set, like most of it, because we, so on this case, for example, since the beginning, I, uh, okay, uh, I knew, okay, I'm going to go this temperature for the interior Lincoln Memorial before. So it's like 2,700 Kelvin, for example. And then after the transition, I want to go like 4,600. And, and then just make those notes, send it to the guy who, the second unit guy who shot the, in the Lincoln Memorial. Um, then, of course, keep, keep the log of everything. And then every time we went to that location, I tried to match it. And then, you know, we had a, a DIT on set. So we, even though we didn't do any complex uh, color correction on set, we still wanted to do some we had no lots. We just had some some uh, basic, very basic. We corrected all the Rec 709 and just did a little bit of a tweak. And then what you see in the final grade is uh, that same idea, and they just polish it and keep it more consistent, just polishing the differences, uh, especially on exteriors and stuff like that. But I would say most of the looks we try to design on set. Um, also, because, you know, we were doing the color during shooting, we were doing uh, maybe on a day off, on a prep day, or on, even a w on a weekend, we would go in and do the color correction for the early episodes. So you don't have a lot of time to play. So I would get a rough cut, send the notes to the colorist, Roy, a Technicolor, and then I would say, okay, um, this scene ended up being a little warmer than I wanted. Can we cool it down? 
this is a little bright, this is a little dark, level, just very, very rough notes with time code. And then I would sit down and see a pass, a first pass, uh, and then they just polish. But uh, I would say the uh, same thing again as teamwork. Sometimes the, color, the colorist would come up with an idea, say, hey, what I thought for this, what if we, instead of doing this, we went like that, he would show me an option. And then we would go with that, you know? So um, it's just your last chance to kind of light, do the lighting of, of the project. So it was really, really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, well, before I let you go, I wanted to ask a little bit about your sort of, for lack of a better word, philosophy when it comes to lenses, because I know on this show you primarily stick to primes. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, we talk, we've talked before about how there's a tendency sometimes filmmakers for the sake of speed and efficiency, you just want to slap a zoom on there and, you know, go in and out. Uh, but you contend that it's a very different feel and look if you're just, you know, actually using the prime lenses and swapping them out. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, of course, if, if you're doing, um, my philosophy is always flexible when it comes to the, each project, because sometimes you do want to put a zoom and be able to work fast. But in terms of, of this specific show, and in general, my preference, just because I like the look of primes, I mean, the design of the lenses is much better when it comes to, because you are optimized for a single focal length. So it, it always has a better look, in my opinion, the, when you put a prime lens on, you know, and then when you work with primes, it makes you think what your shot is. It just, it's not like, okay, I'm going to stand here and zoom in and have, get a close up of the actors. Like, I want to make sure that we're, I'm telling the right story with this lens. Am I seeing the right amount of background? Do I want a more background? Do I want less background? Do I want to feel physically close to the actor or not? So uh, for me, it's like, okay, this really needs like a wide lens close up. So, okay, let's, you put a 27, you get really close. Then you'll see more background and you'll feel close to the actor. So it's a kind of an, um, it really makes you think about those things instead of, okay, you do your wide shot, like a lot of network shows though, uh, do. You uh, go back where your master is, literally punch in and that's your shots. Well, yeah, but sometimes you don't wanna be on that same axis. Sometimes you wanna go to a different axis. So if you're gonna move the camera, why not get off that master shot, get where you feel the camera should be with the actor if it's close, if it's a little longer and farther away, if it's close and wide, you know, but it makes you think about that decision. Um, and then, and, you know, sometimes directors are like, I just want to uh, put a lens on, a zoom lens. I'm like, well, I mean, we can do that, but it's really not going to do the same as a prime lens, you know, like in terms of, of the design of where you put the camera. And of course, of the quality of the fall off and the quality of um, definition and the bokeh and everything that zoom lenses are not as good as, you know? Um, well, my last question for you is sort of a more general question because uh, I'm a big fan of not only your work as a cinematographer, but your work as a director on uh, the show SEAL Team. I really love the episodes of that you've directed. And I'm, I'm curious, my, my last question is just sort of how has, when you direct, um, how do you feel that being a cinematographer has informed your work as a director and vice versa? After, you know, do you does your experience as a director affect how you approach your job as a cinematographer? Yeah, I think, I mean, as a um, director, I, I would say it's, it's I, I didn't think it was going to be that much, but I think it's crazy how much you, you end up using from what you learn as a cinematographer. I would say you use 99% of the what you learn, you know, it really, well, I mean, of course, when you're directing, you don't have to necessarily worry about if you're going to use IR MDs or if you're going to, but, you know, sometimes, um, everything that else that you know helps, you know, like, you know, you want to shoot backlight, you know, you don't want to be in a location at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. If, if you're on exteriors, it's stuff like that, that will let you, when you're directing, will make the DP very happy, <laughs> you know, and at the same time, it will make it, the, the show look better and it would be more efficient. And then same thing, you know, the some actors work certain ways, so you know how to, approach each scene with uh, with their, your experience as a DP, knowing that um, how what actors like and don't like uh, from when you work with actors for so long as a, as a DP. So I would say you um, being a DP is a really great way of learning about directing. Of course, there's things that you have no clue, like, you know, that you have to learn, like, you know, acting and stuff like that. Even though you develop an eye for, for realism when you direct, when you shoot, when you direct, you have to talk to the actors, which is a completely different skill. 
Um, and then the other way, when you're directing and then you go on and shoot something after that, I do think, uh, first of all, I think it's very humbling. And I know a lot of DPs said that you should do at least one movie uh, as a DP because it will make you a better DP. And I know a lot of people have done that. And just because you understand the process of what goes on also behind, you know, how, like, you know, storytelling and, this, and uh, some decisions that uh, sometimes you're, when you're shooting, you don't really see, um, you understand much better. Or you understand there's a reason behind the reason that you don't understand. And I think it, it just makes you a better collaborator because you understand that the director has to deal with a lot of other issues. So for me, it's, and then if you understand the process, it makes you also better as a DP because you'll understand, okay, this is an in intimate scene. So I know that director has a difficult actor on set because I can see that. So I'm gonna give him some space or I'm gonna make it easy for him to talk to this actor in, when it comes to lighting. I'm in a lighter room instead of light. So stuff like that, that will just, make your collaboration um, better with them, you know? Um, and then just also the process of um, story. I think when you when you are a DP, you work from the story, but a lot of times you don't get a chance to change any of that. And when you are a director, you have a chance, all the experience of all those years of not being able to change things and trying to make it better with um, the way you should you were able to do when you're a director and then use those tools when you go back and shoot. So I think it's a great compliment. I really like doing both. Great. Well, I've really enjoyed uh, this conversation with you, Gonzalo. I hope that uh, next time we do it, we can do it uh, in person at the clubhouse maybe. But uh, <laughs> yeah. thanks so much for uh, doing this and talking with me about Man in the High Castle. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks, thanks again for you, uh, to you and to the ASC. And uh, I hope you, you know, we get to do this again soon. Me too. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.